Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And last month, I uploaded this channel's first Fallout investigation in several years. And while I wasn't really expecting it to perform that well, I was more or less just looking for an excuse to play some Fallout, much to my pleasant surprise, our exploration of the Dunwich mystery did astoundingly well. And I'm interpreting that performance as permission from you guys to continue scratching my post-apocalyptic itch. At least for another video. Thus, today, we're going to be turning our attention to what I consider to be the Fallout universe's other great mystery. That being the curious presence of the Zetan aliens. Indeed, as you're probably already at least somewhat familiar with, since the Fallout franchise's inception in 1997, literally every single game has included references to, or outright instances of, a suspicious species of little green men hailing from beyond the stars. While in the early days, these extraterrestrial hints were clearly meant to be taken more as easter eggs than anything else, over the years Bethesda has progressively expanded upon the lore behind these guys, in some pretty significant, if sometimes indirect, ways. We first investigated this mystery around three years ago in 2019. But since then, a series of updates to Fallout 76 and steady stream of discoveries in some of the older titles have rendered that previous video utterly outdated. So today, I would like to comprehensively revisit the question of alien life in the Fallout universe, incorporating all of that new information and some of the stuff that was left out of the original to get us all up to speed on the nature of these big-headed boys. Thus, kick back, grab a plate of your finest iguana bites, pour out a chill glass of sunset sarsaparilla, and relax as we investigate the origins, and more importantly, the intentions of Fallout's aliens. But first, quick word from today's video sponsor, who makes such investigations so possible. This video is being brought to you guys by War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicular combat game ever made, with a collection of over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships from the 1920s to the present day, and an in-depth customization system featuring hundreds of camouflages, decals, and pieces of equipment you can easily emulate your favorite historical arsenals or build something one of a kind. Every vehicle was built with a laser focus on accuracy and attention to detail, ensuring an immersive and realistic experience. I'm personally impressed by the authentic vehicle damage systems, which accurately reflect the weak and strong points of historical pieces rather than just rely on a generic hitbox. When you're done with this video, check out War Thunder using my link. Available on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. You'll receive a free bonus pack featuring multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and more. Alright, so as is tradition on this channel, despite our extraterrestrial subjects being present in literally every single Fallout product ever made, we're going to start by analyzing their actions and references in Fallout 4, the title that I think we're all the most familiar with, and my favorite for capturing footage. Shortly after the player reaches level 20, usually immediately after, a unique world event will trigger, wherein a strange zooming sound can be heard before a mysterious flying object jolts across the sky and appears to crash in the horizon. The estimated flight path will lead us to an area just south of Oberland Station, where a small cloud of fire and smoke reveals what remains of a not-so-flying saucer. While a remarkable sight in and of itself, this isn't even the best part. 
as a trail of some green liquid can be found, leading away from the impact zone. And by following it, we'll eventually arrive at a nearby cave, where a very hostile little green man will make his final stand. The creature is only slightly shorter than the player, though boasts a much more fragile frame and larger head. It's wearing a spacesuit of some kind with a pack on its back, though no clear breathing apparatus. Even though the alien's helmet is off, it seems to be at least functioning with just human air. Furthermore, as we close in on this cave, a unique alien distress signal will become accessible on our Pip-Boy. It's completely undiscernible what's being said, but this transition offers us an example of the Zetan language. Take a listen. Now, despite his obvious technological superiority and his very powerful blaster, which we'll get into in a second, this alien is a surprisingly weak opponent. He spawns in with a measly 50 points of HP, making the Cosmic Visitor significantly less resilient than a common raider. Now, you might be thinking, hold on a minute, Nate. Didn't this little guy just survive an impact from space? Of course he's gonna be a little bit on the weaker side, he's very wounded. But this contrast of devastating technological prowess with an apparent physical weakness will actually form a sort of theme that defines the Zetans throughout the franchise and become very important later. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. After defeating E.T., we can loot his unique alien blaster from his inventory, as well as a few hundred rounds of its special ammo. Boasting a unique model and chrome texture, the item delivers roughly 50 points of damage per hit, which is pretty strong, but somewhat offset by its slow projectile speed, and the fact that it has a very finite amount of ammo. Though, if the player has a maxed out science perk, we can take it to a workbench and convert it to using laser rounds instead, which gets around the ammo ceiling, though weakens its overall damage. Notably, while this extraterrestrial affair is the only direct interaction we have with the Zetans in the base game, more on the DLCs later, there are a couple more subtle references to their existence, hidden away in unlikely relics of pre-war culture. Within the Hubris Comics department store in downtown Boston, lying in an office is a copy of a collectible magazine titled Invasion of the Zetans, which will bestow a 5% damage buff on our alien blaster when obtained. More importantly than its advantage, though, the magazine's cover depicts an extremely accurate representation of the creature we just encountered, and definitively refers to it as Zayton. This highly suggests that the pre-war world was, at least to some degree, aware of the alien race's existence, or at the very least, speculated a lot about it. Furthermore, as many of you likely already know, in Fallout 4 there exists a playable Pip-Boy holotape game called Zeta Invaders, which imitates the real-world Space Invaders Atari classic. Perhaps in the Fallout universe, much like our own, UFO encounters and sightings of these little green men were a popular phenomenon back in the day. We'll have more to say about exactly how much the old world, 
and particularly the old world governments knew about the aliens in a bit. But for now, I'd like to turn your attention to the term Zen, which is what the comic calls these aliens and what we find them referred to as throughout the franchise. But more specifically, what do Zetan and Zeta mean exactly? Is it the name of the planet they're all from, or the term used to define some intergalactic empire, perhaps? Well, while Bethesda hasn't given us a complete answer quite yet, I do have a theory. You see, in our universe, the term Zeta is used to designate a handful of star systems and non-planetary celestial bodies. But the most well-known of which, and the most associated with extraterrestrial activity, is a star system roughly 22 trillion miles away from Earth in the Milky Way galaxy known as Zeta Reticuli. This system is believed to consist of 11 planets and two stars, creatively designated as Zeta-1 and Zeta-2, both of which are extremely similar to our own Sun, with them boasting 96 and 99% of our Sun's mass respectively, and similar radiuses. Here's where things get kinda of fun, though. In the late 1960s, a couple named Betty and Barney Hill claimed to have been abducted by a mysterious humanoid alien race while on the roads of rural New Hampshire, and taken in a spaceship to an unfamiliar part of the cosmos. While in captivity, the couple claim a series of experiments were performed on them and questions asked. However, both insist that the aliens treated them rather humanely. Afterward, the hills were simply deposited back into their car and had no memory of the affair. However, over the coming months and years, they both slowly began to recall their experiences through a series of bizarre dreams, therapy, and psychic sessions. During one of these psychic sessions, Betty was apparently able to recollect a map that the creatures apparently showed her, and drew a copy of this star map for researchers. After a careful, or dubious, analysis depending on who you ask, several folks in the astronomical community determined that Betty and Barney Hill were very likely taken somewhere in the Zeta Reticuli star system. And as a result, this whole episode is now often referred to as the Zeta Incident. While it's since been overshadowed by other tales, it's difficult to understate what a big deal this story was back in the 60s and 70s. It sold Adam knows how many books, and was even the cover story of the December 1974 issue of Astronomy Magazine. An issue which Astronomy Magazine soon retracted and has made very clear that it deeply regrets ever publishing. Nonetheless, it seems to me that Bethesda is drawing a connection here. The Zetans of the Fallout universe are very likely named after the Zetans allegedly encountered by the Hills, which makes even more sense when you consider the universe's setting. Fallout takes place in a world somewhat stuck in 1960s culture with 22nd century technology. It makes sense that their aliens would be based on a famous encounter from the 60s. Alright, well, with our pseudo-astronomy out of the way, let's return to Fallout 4. Specifically, to the game's Nuka World DLC, where we have more to learn about this cosmic phenomenon. As nearby the Galactic Zone, just west of the Grandchester Mystery Mansion, in the remains of a dilapidated diner, we can find the Habologist's Camp, where a small group of very <laughs> eccentric characters have set up shop. These folks claim to be following some religion or philosophy called Habology, 
Though the entire organization is very standoffish regarding what Habology is, actually, or what it all means. Evidently, such information is privileged, and only made available to its actual members. All that we're able to discern is that it has something to do with space and spirituality. Nonetheless, secrecy aside, the group's leader, a woman named Dara, will approach the player with an interesting offer. She claims that her men have identified an alien spacecraft tucked away in the Nuka World junkyard. She believes that this craft can be used to help her group reach the stars. But first, the area will need to be cleared of the various hostile robots still protecting the perimeter. Dara will offer us several hundred caps if we're willing to lead the Hubologists into battle against these automated gatekeepers. Such begins the quest, Trip to the Stars. Long story short, while we do eventually easily dispatch the robots, it's revealed that the supposed alien spacecraft is really just a decommissioned amusement park ride. We can try and explain these facts to Dara and company, tell them that, hey, this is just a toy, but the Hubologists will have none of it, and insist that we take them to space in the device. From here, the group will load up into the not-so-flying saucer, we'll turn it on for them, they'll spin around for a few seconds, and the quest will be completed. The Hubologists will leave, none the wiser to the fact that they just rode in a kid's toy, thinking that they actually went to space, and vow to continue researching their new prized possession. Now, while it's easy to write this whole affair off as merely the product of a bunch of kooks with more caps than brain cells, here's where things get kinda interesting. As a reward for being such a great helper, on top of our normal payment, Dara will also give the player what she calls a prized family heirloom of hers that was supposedly acquired by the founder of her religion centuries ago. The Hub's Alien Blaster. And what's this? It's a real alien blaster. The device is completely identical, both in appearance and damage output, to the Zeta alien blaster we can find at the crash site, and uses the same alien ammunition. If the Hubologists are so crazy, then how in Atom's name do they have access to genuine extraterrestrial technology? Dora will explain that their faith was founded shortly before everything went boom by an author named Richard Hubble, who somehow managed to ascertain certain secrets and hidden truths about the nature of reality from an extraterrestrial source. Evidently, Dora is in fact one of Richard Hubble's direct descendants, and she has every intention of fulfilling his prophecy. A prophecy that the woman still refuses to elaborate upon, as we're yet to become full members. Now, I think at this point, most players would consider the Hubology storyline to be over, and move on to the next Nuka World activity. But, believe it or not, there's a somewhat hidden continuation to this plot that will allow us to uncover a good bit more about this group's ideas. You see, after all's completed and we've received the alien blaster, we can speak with a man named Phil Roller, who will offer us a chance to finally formally join the organization. As Phil explains, though, Hubology isn't like most religions, where you just convert and are essentially immediately equal to everyone else. No. Instead, they have a sort of tier system, where members are expected to level up. With each new level, a member is entrusted with more secrets of Hubology. 
There are a total of eight ranks the Soul Survivor may progress through, and with each one, we unlock some unique dialogue that gives us additional insight into the beliefs of this oh-so-bizarre faction. How does one level up in Hubology, you may ask? Well, that's easy. Just pay Phil and Dara increasingly large sums of money and sit in a chair called a Zeta Aligner to receive a small dose of radiation. That's it. That's the whole thing. Just open up your pocketbooks, sit in a chair, and boom, you've leveled up. Each time you return for another rank up, the required cap donation and amount of radiation you'll be exposed to will both increase exponentially. By the time you're ready to hit level 8, the fee will be an astounding 10,000 caps. Literally, the most expensive purchase in the entire game. According to Phil, these radiation treatments are necessary to cleanse our body of something called neurodynes. And, well, I'll just let him explain what that means. What are neurodynes? Neurodynes build up in your brain, clouding your ability to think. After an alignment, you will think more clearly and be happier. I am ready. Then please sit in the Zeta aligner. Furthermore, as mentioned, as we move through the ranks, more and more information about the faith will be revealed. And frankly, it just gets increasingly kooky. Or does it? Over the course of our progression, Dara and Phil tell us that Richard Hubble, the founder of Hubology, actually made contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence called the Star Father before the Great War. This Star Father supposedly revealed the truth about Neurodynes to Richard and warned him of mankind's impending doom. According to Dara, Mr. Hubble never passed away, but ascended to the planet of Quetzal to live with the Star Father in his old age, before everything went boom, and left his people with a vague plan on how to follow his footsteps. The Hubologists hope to one day take to the stars themselves, and reunite with their founder on this mysterious Quetzal planet so that they may regroup and eventually return to Earth to shepherd it in a more appropriate direction. What is this final mystery? The Star Father can free our minds of all restraints. We will be like gods, able to do unimaginable things. Then we will return to Earth to rule over mankind. It is a glorious task the Star Father has given us. Yes, we will end the scourge of Neurodynes once and for all. The human race will reach its full potential under our benevolent guidance. Now, while it's hard to not squint your eyes at all of this, we do have to take into account that Richard Hubble must have somehow acquired an actual alien blaster, one which shows no indication of being a forgery. So, despite throwing up more red flags than a communist parade, there's clearly at least a kernel of truth beneath all of the Hubologists' muck. Furthermore, while the procedure seems completely mundane, there's likely a lot more to those Zeta radiation treatments we receive at each rank up than meets the eye. For one, those of you who took chemistry may note that in the real world, Zeta radiation is not a thing. It doesn't exist. The four types of radiation known to man are alpha, beta, neutrons, and electromagnetic waves, or gamma currents. Zeta radiation is not acknowledged by any serious institution, and appears to be a complete work of fiction by the creators of Fallout. But nonetheless, 
As far as the parameters of this universe are concerned, Zeta radiation seems to be an actual force. And the Hibologists aren't just messing with us when they seed us in the aligner. You see, after each treatment, the player will actually receive a small boost in their intelligence stat, which increases exponentially along with the size of the radiation dose after every session. By the time we've reached AHS-8, we will have received an over 30 point increase in our intelligence special stat, which is absolutely nothing to gawk at. Furthermore, we can actually encounter Zeta radiation, at least conceptually, in another part of the wasteland. Indeed, during the events of the Cabot House questline, the energy seems to play a major role in containing Lorenzo Cabot. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the whole nature of the Cabot family, I recommend checking out our last video on the Dunwich Mystery, as a fairly exhaustive summary of their shenanigans is provided there. But for the sake of not repeating the same 20 minute section, I'm just going to assume most of y'all are up to speed with what's up. Anyway, in various terminal entries, Jack describes the force field used to seal his father in Parson State Asane Asylum as using Zeta Waves. And, as a reward for completing the quest and siding with Jack, he'll give us a unique device called the Zeta Blaster. A gamma blaster that's been modified to project Zeta radiation and has a unique red projectile animation. Notably, this version of the device does considerably less damage than the original, though it produces an especially powerful stagger effect, which makes sense, as in terminal entries, Jack explains that the device was designed to be a sort of portable containment field for Lorenzo, to be used only if he were ever needed to be transferred outside of Parsons while inflicting as minimal damage as possible. Additionally, and here's the real smoking gun, literally in a way, the Zeta Aligner chair in the Hibologist's camp seems to be modified with the exact same radiation dish as is found on Jack Cabot's Zeta Blaster, confirming that they are indeed using a similar technology. So, what's going on here? Is Zeta radiation some type of extraterrestrial gift, or recent scientific discovery only known by a select few? Well, the lore isn't exactly clear. Jack Cabot refers to the field trapping his father as both a Zeta perimeter and as an a Bremelin field. This is interesting because it seems to allude to the Book of Abremelin, a 14th century Renaissance-era text that describes the story of an Egyptian mage, who teaches his dark magic to a German man in the town of Worms, in exchange for some unfortunate promises. So perhaps there's a magical, rather than scientific, or even cosmic explanation behind this phenomenon. Either way, we'll return to the concept of Zeta Radiation and Abremelin Fields later on in the video. For now, let's move on to Fallout 3, and explore what the Capital Wasteland reveals about our celestial subjects. Because boy, does it reveal a lot. Now, those of you who have read ahead are probably expecting me to talk about the UFO crash we can find in the deserts outside of DC. And we will in a second. First, there's a certain terminal entry I'd like to turn your attention to, however. Within the Brotherhood of Steel Citadel, the ancient fortress that was once known as the Pentagon and headquarters for American wartime planners, a number of pre-war computers and documents can be found. Most of these have to do with the construction of Liberty Prime, and the daily minutia of reporting to old generals. 
However, one lonely desktop sitting in a room all by itself in the Citadel's B Wing contains an interesting report. It's titled, Report on UFO Codenamed Paladine, and it reads, quote, Further investigations into the UFO codenamed Paladine have confirmed our suspicions. On the evening of May 3rd, 2062, an alien craft of unknown make and origin did indeed breach the airspace just north of Hagerstown, Maryland, and crashed into a heavily wooded, non-residential area. Unfortunately, attempts to retrieve the craft proved unsuccessful. It simply could not be located, either due to some kind of advanced invisibility shielding, or because the occupants managed to make the repairs and vacate the crash before our arrival. Despite our failure of recovery, the significance of this event cannot be denied. We are not alone." End quote. This report seems to confirm that no later than May 3rd, 2062, the United States government was accurately aware of an extraterrestrial presence in its midst. And, as we'll see later, the government was probably made aware a whole lot earlier than that. Moving beyond the Citadel, but speaking of crashed UFOs, in the irradiated wastes north of the city proper, just southwest of Volt 92 and north of the MDPL-13 power station, we the player will be able to pick up on an interesting new radio signal. It's titled, Garbled Beacon. Take a listen. Indeed, this strange recording sounds quite a bit similar to the radio signal we encountered in Fallout 4. It seems to be the same language. Now, oddly enough, there's a bit of a debate within the community regarding whether or not this specific recording contains a hidden message of sorts. You see, while it sounds like just a bunch of alien gobbledygook, when the audio file is reversed and slowed down, many players believe they can hear the words The alien never lives in English. No matter, should we follow the signal, we'll eventually arrive at yet another UFO crash site. Unlike the one we found in Fallout 4, this saucer seems to have been here for a while, and is of a somewhat different design. It's not perfectly circular, and has an exposed cabin. Nearby will be the remains of the extraterrestrial pilot, as well as a special alien blaster, and a few dozen rounds for us to collect. This version of the alien blaster is also a little bit different than the last one. It does considerably more damage, being able to eliminate most enemies with just a single shot, or at most two, and boasts a distinct silver and blue texture. Now, obviously, ammo for this item is Fionite, and unlike in Fallout 4, we can't just take it to a bench to modify it to run on a more sustainable power source. However, Believe it or not, there are a handful of locations across the game where we can find some more. And these locations are pretty revealing in my opinion. North of Andale and west of the Fairfax ruins lies Fort Independence, an old US intelligence office and bunker that currently serves as the headquarters for the Brotherhood of Steel's outcasts. A splinter faction of the Brotherhood who has rebelled against the mainstream leadership, believing that the Elders have strayed too far from their sworn purpose. Get it? Fort Independent Splinter Faction? Yeah, it's a thing. Anyway, towards the bottom of the massive bunker complex beneath the fort, tucked safely behind a master-locked vault door, is a small armory. 
which contains an assortment of high-level gear. And within one of the crates are several dozen more alien blaster rounds, allowing us to replenish our reserves. It's unclear whether this armory was stocked by the Brotherhood outcasts themselves or the old government, but obviously one of these two institutions must have somehow acquired this technology, possibly from another UFO crash, or some other means. Furthermore, a somewhat less ambiguous source of alien blaster replenishment can be found in the deserts north of Evergreen Mills at Fort Bannister. Fort Bannister is currently occupied by a legion of hostile Talon Company forces, but it was once one of the nation's largest bases. Its importance is made apparent by the number of massive craters surrounding it. It seems like this fort was the subject of several direct strikes at the onset of the Great War. I wonder what made it such a prominent target. No matter, in one of the larger craters just south of the base's fences, an overturned truck can be found, and just under it are dozens of more alien rounds. There can be no denying it here. These were unequivocally in the hands of the United States at one point in time. Now, while there isn't much lore on the nature of Fort Bannister in the base game, terminals don't tell much of a story, and it's not brought up in any dialogue, the Fallout 3 official game guide does tell an interesting tale about the location's association with otherworldly forces. In a brief paragraph about the nature of the Zetans, the guide says the following. Once thought to be covered up by the government and believed only by crackpot groups such as the Quare Verum, evidence of extraterrestrial life can be traced back throughout human history, but became nationally recognized after the mysterious disappearance of the Clarabella 7 space pod during the 1960s space race. It is said that alien technology was the basis of many of the Enclave's more exotic and impressive weaponry and robots. And even toy manufacturers, such as Wilson's Automatoys, weren't immune to these accusations. Recently, after the discovery of an alien body at Fort Bannister, the shocking truth was revealed. The aliens are not only real and alive, but they're back, and they are ticked off. Now, there's a lot to dissect here, and we'll soon touch upon the Quare Verum and the association between the Enclave and alien technology that this passage refers to, but the fact that it blatantly states there was once an alien body stored at Fort Bannister is especially relevant here. It's not clear whether or not the discovery of this body was made before or after the world erupted, and sadly, we can't actually find any alien remains in the game itself, but clearly, the United States was very aware of the Zetans, and conducted a considerable amount of research from this very site. Finally, the last location alien blaster materials can be located at is Adams Air Force Base, a massive Enclave-controlled fortress just north of the Capital Wasteland proper. Adams AFB is not accessible in the base game. We only visit it during the events of the Broken Steel expansion, which continues the main quest line after Project Purity. During the quest, who dares wins, this will be where the Enclave makes their final stand. Within the armory of the AFB's mobile base crawler, which we reach at the climax of the quest, and sort of serves as our reward for completing Broken Steel, we will find not only a bunch of new rounds, but a whole nother alien blaster altogether lying in a crate. Indeed, it would seem as though the Enclave 2, itself a remnant of the old government, 
was acutely aware of the extraterrestrial interlopers, and in possession of some of their greatest technologies. Sadly, while this base is full of terminal entries and dialogue providing lore on the Enclave's final retreat, nothing in the quest relates to the blaster. It's just there as a reward with no additional context. Still though, between the Citadel UFO report and all the sites where we find additional alien rounds, I think we've firmly established that the pre-war United States wasn't at all ignorant of the alien truth, and taking serious, somewhat successful steps to study and recover their tech. Now, in just a moment, we'll take a look at the real elephant in the room, Fallout 3's Mothership Zeta DLC, which is a complete goldmine of additional lore. However, first, there's one thing that I really wanted to talk about, but haven't been sure how or where to bring it up. You see, as I've already mentioned, the alien blaster of Fallout 3 is an almost entirely different device than the one we find at Fallout 4's crash site, at least in appearance and handling. However, the Fallout 3 blaster does actually make an appearance in Fallout 4. We just can't obtain it via the vanilla game. Within the Galactic Zone at Nuka World, there are these alien animatronics who attack the player, and the blaster they use to do so looks exactly like the Fallout 3 version. Additionally, while we can't pick up the blaster, it just despawns after we destroy the animatronics, it's totally unlootable, we can equip it through the use of console commands. And it comes with a full suite of first-person animations, including, most prominently, a reload animation, suggesting that at one point in time, Bethesda expected us to be able to earn this thing and use it, though must have scrapped the idea. You have to wonder, however, how did the Nuka World executives so accurately manage to reproduce such a definitively cosmic technology? Should we just write this off as a meaningless decision by Bethesda, or were the writers communicating something more important here? We know that the Galactic Zone was built in collaboration between Nuka World and Robco, Robert House's company. And as we'll get into in our New Vegas section, Mr. House had an obsession with the stars. If any private interest would have known about the Zettons, it would be his. No matter, this tangent is just some food for thought. Now, let's move on to Mothership Zeta. Released in August of 2009, Mothership Zeta was the final and definitely strangest Fallout 3 DLC of them all. As its name implies, it sends us to the Zetan mothership following an abduction near that crashed UFO site we just mentioned. Or at least, it sends us to one of the Zetan motherships, as the questline strongly implies that there are several similar spacecraft operating around Earth. Nonetheless, the aliens would not treat us kindly, and we'd lead a revolt among the other abductees aboard the ship, eventually taking the thing over, and even destroying another massive mothership in a duel towards the end. As you might imagine, throughout this wacky journey, we'd be able to deduce a considerable amount of lore and info regarding this whole extraterrestrial operation. We'd have the ability to access a database of audio logs kept by the aliens of interrogations between them and various individuals they've abducted. Many of these holotapes are downright hilarious, as we can hear the aliens gargling and baffled people trying to make sense of what's happening, but a few of these are particularly notable. In one audio log, the extraterrestrials seem to be interviewing an abducted Volt Tech executive, who was actually inspecting Volt 76, 
the main vault of Fallout 76 at the time of his abduction. Take a listen. Hey now, no reason to get yourselves worked up. Whatever you need, I'm going to tell it to you. Well, pretty sure you want me to talk into this thing, so here goes. My name is Giles Walstoncroft. I'm the current Assistant Chief Executive Officer of the Vault Tech Corporation. I was inspecting the construction site of Vault 76 when I was captured what I can only assume are alien beings from another world. I'm not sure what they want from me or what they will do to me, but whatever they need, I will readily provide. Perhaps if I can bridge our communication gap and establish a rapport with them, we can enter into an exclusive trade agreement. In fact, instead of talking to this damn machine, I'm going to attempt to address them directly. On behalf of the vault -Tec Corporation, I'd like to extend a heartfelt welcome to you. Wait, you don't need that. Wait! Finally, the last holotape I think is worth a listen is one left by a man abducted from Salem, Massachusetts in the 1600s. And... It's just great. What? Talk into this thing? Just... talk? I, I don't have to do anything else? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Ow! All right! Ow! I said all right, just stop! <sighs> hello. Um... Hello. My name is Andrew Endicott. On the night of May 17th, the year of our Lord 1697, I was... I was taken from my home in Salem Village. I... I do not know where I am, exactly, or why I came to be here. I've seen through... windows. The stars, and sun, and beloved Earth. Down there, below me. So it would seem I am aboard some... vessel, suspended in the ether. Ironically, it would seem so close to where I thought heaven must surely lie. But this is not heaven, and my captors are not angels. I'm not entirely unconvinced that the scripture is wrong, that heaven and hell are reversed, for my captives are devils, demons from my nightmares. Even now, they watch me, make me talk. They seem to want me to tell my story. I know not why, a record of their deeds, perhaps? Or am I just a pawn in some... some evil game? And there are others, other... captives, I mean. From whence they came, I cannot say. Some wear strange dress, as if they are from... a different time. And some are... frozen, as in ice. Unmoving, but... I think... alive. I believe they plan the same fate for me. Will I be frozen too? Will I- uh, Ow! Stop it! I did what you said! You wanted me to talk, so I talked! Just leave me! Just leave me be! Clearly, these beings have been interested in Earth for a very, very long time. Furthermore, while most of the fellow abductees whom we encounter are contemporary from the Wasteland, you know, raiders, mutant schools, enclave personnel, all roughly abducted around the same time as us, a few of the folks we encounter are several centuries old. There's a cowboy who was taken from his ranch in Texas sometime around the 1800s. And, even more impressively, we meet a Japanese samurai named Toshiro Kago, who doesn't speak any English, or even modern Japanese for that matter, his language is more archaic, but judging from the Oda Shi clan sigil on his armor, he could not have been taken any later than the year 1562, making this guy the oldest character in Fallout history and pushing the latest possible date of Zetan Earth Contact to 715 years prior to the events of Fallout 3. And it probably happened way before that. Survivors and holotapes aside, 
While aboard the ship, we can also learn the story of an ancient pre-war group called the Quare Verum, or Seekers of the Truth, in Latin. You may note that the group was briefly mentioned in that game guide paragraph regarding the alien body at Fort Bannister. The Quare Verum were a small gang of roughly four or five alien theorists who lived shortly before the world fell apart. They not only believed in the existence of extraterrestrials, but were convinced that the US government also knew about and was studying them. Two claims which we've already more than validated in this video. No matter, in their heyday, the Quare Verum were considered crackpots by most, and never taken seriously by any of the media outlets or academics who they tried to sway to their side. In an effort to prove their theories right once and for all, the members devised a daring plan. They had identified a certain alien technology being harbored at a US military base near DC, possibly Fort Bannister, and planned to break in and steal the device, leaving behind a crude replica in its place in the hopes that no one would notice. Shockingly, this operation actually succeeded, and the Quare Verum successfully stole an early prototype plasma blaster, which they claim was designed with extraterrestrial technology. Unfortunately for them, the group was not as sly as they thought they were, and the government had a mole in the organization which quickly ratted them out, and within days, most of the members had disappeared. The last survivor, a man named Reed Underwood, confident that he would soon be next, stored this secret government device in a safe locked by his terminal, and buried everything in the deserts, in the hopes that one day someone else would find it and be able to carry on his struggle. In Mothership Zeta's cargo hold, we can find this very safe, and read Underwood's terminal, which tells the whole dramatic story. Evidently, the government never got their tech back. The Zettons did. The device that caused all of this fuss is the MPLX, or Military Plasma Experimental Nova Surge, a unique prototype plasma blaster, which deals considerably more damage, like three times more, but uses two rounds of ammo for each shot, and weighs a whole lot more than the standard. Also inside the safe is a note left behind by the government scientists who were working on the device, evidently also stolen by Reed, which reads the following. Quote, The Nova Surge has proven to be a tough nut to crack. The output is still very high, causing massive injury to targets, but it's drawing too much power from its energy cells. We also need to get the weight down on the device, as it's a bit heavy for a simple replacement sidearm. The problem seems to be the coolant coils, which are accounting for almost 50% of the item's weight. The good news is that housing for the weapon has been approved, and this is likely the final design. Unfortunately, I need to increase our staff's hours to seven days a week again so we can have the final prototype ready for testing by the end of the year." End quote. The reason I bring this whole story up, besides the fact that it plays an intricate role in the Mothership Zeta expansion, is that it all highly suggests that plasma technology one of the fundamental types of equipment in the Fallout universe seems to derive itself from Zayton influence. This plasma device was evidently the first of its kind, and would be modified by the government in the lead-up to the Great War and by the Enclave afterward, to form one of the pillars of Enclave tech and the Wasteland arsenal. So every time we pick up a plasma something, we're technically arriving with a cosmically derived piece of work. Interesting food for thought. Moving on, however, Mothership Zeta also provides us with what seems to be a considerable amount of insight 
on the minutia of daily alien life. We get glimpses of plates with alien food on them. The Zetans seem to enjoy bug-like organisms and are big on unfried calamari, which may suggest that such species are native to, or at least exist on or around, their homeworld. Furthermore, their living quarters are highly spartan in nature, consisting of mere stasis chambers which function as beds, and they lack any serious furniture or personal artworks and properties. They're like space commies. As we fight our way through the vessel, we eventually will find ourselves in a massive research lab, where there seem to be two principal experiments going on. The first, and more innocent of which, concerns a massive collection of modified giddy-up buttercup children's toys, with which the aliens seem to be utterly fascinated by. Not only do they have a massive collection of these things, but they even seem to have their own production lines, and they've collected Giddy Up Buttercup advertisement posters as well. It's really strange. There's also one pony surrounded by lifeless test subjects, implying they may have been lethally reprogrammed. I don't know. Some folks have suggested that the Zetans could be modifying the products to spy on the American people. Maybe they're putting cameras and microphones into the devices and listening in on homes. It would be a brilliant strategy given how popular Giddy Up Buttercup is as a brand, but there's nothing in the games to confirm this theory, and it wouldn't explain why they continue to produce and study the Giddy Up Buttercups after civilization collapsed. You may note that earlier in the video, in that paragraph about the alien body at Fort Bannister, the official game guide did describe Wilson's Automatoys, the manufacturer of Giddy Up Buttercup, as being the subject of certain unelaborated upon extraterrestrial accusations. So, there's that. Now, the other, much more sinister experiment going on here may provide part of an explanation regarding what exactly the Zetans want out of mankind. You see, there's an entire subsection of the research lab dedicated to a freakish biological experiment where the aliens seem to be modifying the DNA of abducted humans, possibly crossing it with their own, and producing a foul new lab-grown species. The game appropriately refers to these lab-grown creatures as abominations, and we can find dozens of them penned up being studied by Zetan scientists and workers. The creatures are extremely hostile, and if we decide to release them, they'll attack both the player and their insidious creators. It's difficult to ascertain what the extraterrestrials are hoping to achieve with these beings, but it appears that they're trying to create a new type of super soldier, not entirely unlike what the Enclave was doing with the FEV. As we've already stressed, the aliens themselves are actually quite physically fragile, and can't tolerate more than the tiniest amounts of damage. It's likely that these abominations, which are indeed much stronger, reflect an effort by the aliens to address that weakness. Though, clearly, they haven't ironed out all the quirks. Perhaps this is fundamentally the reason behind the Zetan interest in Earth. Maybe the real value they find in our planet is human DNA for their horrifying genetic experiments. I mean, they haven't shown much of an interest in conquest, or even resource extraction. If they wanted to take over Earth for its water or precious metals, they could have easily done so at any point in the last two millennium. Perhaps the real resource they've come for is our own DNA sequence. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We'll circle back to the topic of alien experimentation later on in our section about Fallout 76. Let's continue with the Mothership storyline for now. 
The Mothership quest climaxes, with the player and fellow rebels storming the vessel's cockpit and overpowering the captain and crew, before a second massive alien mothership suddenly appears and opens fire. We'll have to take over Zeta's death ray and return fire to defeat the reinforcements before the mission is finally completed and we're free to beam back down to Earth. Furthermore, if the player wants to be especially evil and lose a mountain of karma, after the coast is clear, you can aim the death ray at Earth and light it up, which will result in a large chunk of what seems to be Canada getting vaporized. While a heinous action, this shouldn't impact the game any further, besides the massive loss of karma you inflict upon yourself. I find this final sequence notable for two primary reasons. One, evidently Mothership Zeta is not the only alien mothership operating in Earth's orbit. There clearly was at least one other, and possibly more where that came from. And reason number two, is this DLC demonstrates that the Zetans are in possession of massive death rays that they seemingly never used against Earth until the player came along. This is a further demonstration that if the aliens wanted to wipe out human life altogether, there's never really been anything stopping them beyond their own restraint. So perhaps they do see a value in allowing life on the planet to continue, if only to further their deranged genetic experiments. Alright, well that about does it for Mothership Zeta. So far, we've reviewed extraterrestrial information from both Fallout 3 and 4, including their DLCs. But we're still left with the isometric Fallouts and New Vegas and 76 to explore, which themselves all contain a wealth of data. So let's hop in our time machines and set them for 1997 to take a look at the original Fallout. Real quick, big thanks to TKS Mantis for reviewing my Fallout 1 portion of this script and providing me with a considerable amount of the isometric Fallout B-roll that we're using in this video. If you're interested in all things Fallout, especially the interplay variants, he is the expert on all things those. Be sure to check out his channel. The influence of the Zetans and their technology admittedly wouldn't be fleshed out too much until Bethesda's acquisition of the franchise from Interplay in the mid-2000s. However, these original titles still sporadically played with the idea of cosmic technology. The events of what we'll call Fallout 1's main questline revolved around the player's efforts to defeat an antagonist known as The Master a highly mutated former human who had successfully modified himself with the FEV virus to become a sort of 200 IQ god of sorts. The Master planned to completely subjugate the human race before evolving mankind into a bizarre species of his own design. One of the special powers that made the Master so formidable was a sort of psychic influence that he had over normal mortals. He could almost read minds and incite dramatic hallucinations amongst any who stood before him. Now, here's where E.T. may fit into all of this. The only way the Vault Dweller could overcome this strange ability, or at least some of it, was by donning a mysterious device called the Psychic Nullifier. We can find this device being worn by some of the Master's human allies, whom we can steal it from or persuade into just surrendering one to us. While nobody quite elaborates upon how this tech works, this is how the official game guide describes it. Quote, Psychic Nullifier, a strange device, possibly the product of an alien technology. It blocks telepathic or psychic commands." End quote. Furthermore, one of Fallout 1's more rare random encounters would consist of the player stumbling across 
a crashed UFO in the deserts of California, with two alien bodies next to it. Though no additional lore on the nature of this event was offered, it was really just a bit of an easter egg. Nonetheless, setting our time machine a few years in the future, Fallout 2 played with the ideas of celestial interlopers a bit more enthusiastically, though still not nearly as much as the post-Bethesda titles. At the Sierra Madre Army Depot, we could encounter a fascinating artificial intelligence known as Skynet, which was evidently developed prior to the Great War, and originally designed to aid U.S. defense planners and researchers with the study of new technologies. While the humans at the depot perished during the Great War, Skynet survived, and slowly used its algorithms and abandoned database to expand its knowledge, with it eventually achieving self-awareness after a few years. Hilariously, by the time we'd encounter it, Skynet had grown depressingly bored, and the player would be given the choice between helping Skynet get a new robotic body for itself to explore the world in, or destroying Skynet to prevent its unparalleled intelligence from wrecking havoc on what was left of mankind. No matter, according to Skynet's own testimony, it was designed with the help of alien intelligence. When asked about itself, the device's main interface terminal would say the following, quote, Skynet, 207 Skynet was conceived and developed in the year 2050. Through the use of alien technology, a new thinking computer was perfected. In the year 2081, Skynet became self-aware. In 2120, Skynet was given a new set of instructions and then abandoned by the makers. Unfortunately, the details of Skynet's extraterrestrial influences aren't well elaborated on. But this is more evidence for our growing file of government knowledge of alien life. Furthermore, in the ruins of old San Francisco, the Chosen One could encounter a large branch of everybody's favorite faith, the Habologists. San Francisco's Hibologists were not at all unlike those of Nuka World, though they did insist that they were founded in this city, and their chapter was the only one in the wasteland. So perhaps between Fallouts 2 and 4, the group has grown considerably. The faction was deeply unpopular with the other residents of the city, who viewed them as proselytizing con artists whom they wanted nothing to do with. The Hibologists would request that the player help them acquire parts to restart an old space shuttle, the ESS Quetzal, such that they may be able to blast off into the stars and rejoin Richard Hubble on their long-lost planet. Funnily enough, their efforts would actually be successful. However, the endgame cutscene would reveal that everyone aboard the shuttle suffocated shortly after breaching the atmosphere. So, there's that. The scientists ensured a safe and speedy launch of the Quetzal. Unfortunately, they didn't account for having recycled air aboard their ship, and they perished in orbit. Interestingly, we could receive alignments from the Fallout 2 faction much the same as in 4, though there was no direct mention of Zeta radiation being the driving factor. These procedures would result in the player receiving a random boost in luck, or intelligence, after each session. The community also seems to have mastered nuclear fission, and developed a totally new method of enhancing power armor, which they'd share with us in exchange for our help with the whole space shuttle thing. Suffice to say, a very strange cast of characters. We'll come back to them again, later on. Following Fallout 2's release, before Interplay could finish their next project, the rights to the franchise would be acquired by Bethesda Zenimax, and their Fallout 3 would release in 2008. But we already went over that game, so let's take a look at the next one. Fallout New Vegas. 
New Vegas' development was interesting, because while Bethesda now owned the rights to the IP, they essentially subcontracted the whole game to Obsidian Entertainment, which itself was a sort of successor to Interplay and Black Isle, being founded by many of the original Fallout devs and writers. So, in many ways, New Vegas was back in the hands of the original Fallout team. It's in this context that I would like to introduce you to an interesting character, who could be encountered early in the game just under an overpass at the 188 trade post north of El Dorado Lake. The character in question is an orphaned boy called the Forecaster, who, notably, bears an interesting, if not familiar, piece of headwear. When approached and asked about himself, the child explains that he possesses a unique gift, which allows him to forecast events that have yet transpired. Despite his obvious uniqueness, the Forecaster retains a remarkably self-aware and modest demeanor, explaining that he doesn't quite understand his gift or why he has it, and even suggests that some more mundane environmental factors could be at play. When asked about his special helmet, he explains that it's his medicine, and that it helps mitigate severe migraines and feelings of anxiety when he wears it, though the helmet also greatly weakens his gift when worn. In exchange for a small fee of caps, the kid will lend the courier his services, and offer a series of suspiciously accurate, though somewhat cryptic insights into the future of their own life, and the Mojave more generally. All let him take it from here. Hi, mister. I hope you're doing fine today. I don't have a mama or papa anymore. I see them sometimes when I take off my medicine, but they can't stay. I'm pretty used to being on my own. Oh, I don't sell things, mister. I sell thoughts. I can take off my medicine and do some thinking. People say it's real interesting. I don't know, because I never hear it. Some people say that it's a gift. Other people say it's the kind of thinking anyone could do if they watched more than they talked. I don't know which is true. I see a lot. I think a lot. There's a lot to hear through the 188, too. That maybe accounts for the thinking. This thing on my head is headache medicine. It works real good, except I can't think when it's on. Really think, I mean. Thinking hurts you, too? Aw, I wish I could let you have the one on my head, but I can't. It hurts real bad when I don't wear it. Great! What do you want me to think about? I need to take off my medicine. Local, local. The here and now. Little of interest. Things to buy. False hopes and regrets watered down. Washed down in dirty glasses. With regret comes a girl. Smiling sad. Brown robe. Name Veronica. Half here. Wraps her and her heart up like a pack. In the pack. A key, some say. Forecast. Cloudy with a chance of friendship. Ouch. Thinking small only hurts a little, but it's a sharp pain. So long. Indeed, this kid is clearly gifted with some sort of supernatural ability, and, more importantly for our purposes, is clearly donning a psychic nullifier from Fallout 1. It's unclear what's behind his unique condition, he could be experiencing some low-grade form of whatever was up with the Master from Fallout 1, or even be related to him in some capacity. More knowledge about his parents would be helpful, but alas. Moving on, this next alien detail comes with a bit of a caveat. You see, in New Vegas, there is this perk you can choose to activate when creating your character called Wild Wasteland. Wild Wasteland would introduce a series of rather ridiculous interactions and random encounters in the game, 
that the developers thought too absurd to expose players to during normal gameplay. Its description reads, Wild Wasteland unleashes the most bizarre and silly elements of post-apocalyptic America. Not for the faint of heart, or the serious of temperament. Wild Wasteland world events are generally considered to be non-canon, and not to be taken as serious representations of the universe's lore. Nonetheless, if the player had this trade enabled, and approached a certain mesa just north of the Horowitz homestead, you'd stumble upon an interesting scene. A small group of Zetans appear to be inspecting a damaged spacecraft. When the courier was detected, they'd all immediately turn hostile, and open up with a volley of alien blasters. Notably, the ship, the aliens themselves, and all of their equipment seem to be the same extraterrestrial assets used in Fallout 3. The ship is indeed the exact same model of the crashed one north of the power station at the Capital Wasteland. However, due to the non-canon nature of Wild Wasteland events, we shouldn't read too deep into this. And besides, it's not like there's too much to read into here in the first place. It's a downed spacecraft with some alien gobbledygook around it. That's that. But now that we've explored Fallout's 1, 2, 3, New Vegas, and 4, we are left with just one more to go. Fallout 76. While initially, at launch, 76 and the world of Appalachia didn't provide us with a tremendous amount to go off of regarding the Zetans, over the last four or five years, man, it's hard to believe it's been that long, the game has received a considerable amount of updates, expansions, and new events, which have tremendously elaborated upon, and somewhat complicated, the extraterrestrial lore. Arguably, almost as much as Mothership Zeta did. Furthermore, before we get into the weeds of all of this, I would like to provide a huge shout-out to the YouTube channel Uranium Fever. They are experts on all things 76, and have been covering the game for years now. Notably, they generously provided me with pretty much all of the Flatwoods Monster and Invaders from Beyond clips that I was unable to grab myself. I don't know how this video would have worked without their help, so once again, a big thank you to them. But I digress. The first example of an extraterrestrial presence in Appalachia that I'd like to explore is the aforementioned Flatwoods Monster, a mysterious cryptid character that has apparently been terrorizing the people of Flatwoods since well before the Great War. There are several old radio shows we can find on holotapes documenting experiences with the creature, and at the Flatwoods police station, we can even find an old taped interview between some detectives and an alleged witness to the creature, who claims the being even abducted him. This is Deputy D.B. Walton. Interview started at 3.35 a.m. All right, Mr. Pickens, tell me everything that happened by starting from the beginning. I, I was out behind my hot dog stand, taking out the trash, and I saw this light shining from the woods. At first, I thought it was a hunter with a flashlight, but then the light started changing. Changing? How? Well, the light started turning different colors. First it was blue, and then green, in red, and then back to blue. Uh, uh, wait, maybe it was green, blue, red. N no, no, actually, it was. It, it's red, blue. Yep, we get it. What happened next? I suddenly got real dizzy, and, and I dropped the trash bag I was carrying. Next thing I knew, I was on the ground. I don't even remember falling. I looked up, and that's when, that's when I saw it. It, can you be more specific? It was a man, but it also wasn't a man. It had gray skin and these huge black eyes and, 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 it, was, and it was wearing like a spacesuit or something. 
what was really weird was that it wasn't saying anything. But I could hear it anyway. In my mind, it told me to follow it onto its spaceship. The Flatwoods monster again? All right, I've heard enough. Colton Pickens, I'm arresting you for drunken disorderly conduct and indecent exposure. Indecent what? What are you talking about? I didn't do anything wrong. Colton, I found you on the roof of your shack, buck naked, yelling at the top of your lungs. Your blood alcohol was .23. And it took four deputies to get you into handcuffs. We all go on a bender now and then, but you need to keep it at home. Alas, while the detectives clearly didn't buy this whole story, and let's be fair, they weren't exactly being unreasonable with their skepticism, as we know, and will soon prove, it was credible. Indeed, at any random encounter spawn point, between the hours of 8pm and 6am, basically the dead of night, on very rare occasions, the Flatwoods monster will actually spawn in and will attack the player upon detection. Again, big thanks to Uranium Fever for providing the footage here. Lord knows I couldn't get the event to spawn myself. But the beast is clearly of Zayden descent, though notably is using a special suit that emits a purple hue and allows it to hover over the surface. Furthermore, the Flatwoods monster has an array of unique abilities, that enable it to teleport around the player, and even control nearby NPCs to join its attack. Interestingly, after defeating the creature, we'll find an assortment of alien-esque items, like fusion cells, crystals, aluminum, and whatnot, but also Radex and Rataway, suggesting that perhaps the aliens are just as vulnerable to such energy as man is. Now, for the longest time, the Flatwoods monster and this random encounter were the only significant piece of alien lore in the game. However, as Fallout 76 grew in content, so too did the backstory of our mysterious subjects. In April of 2020, 76 received its biggest expansion up until that point, Wastelanders. Wastelanders brought human NPCs and human-driven factions to Appalachia for the first time. It's easy to forget those dark days, but Fallout 76 originally launched without any human characters or dialogue entries, much to the frustration of fans. One of the pinnacle factions introduced by Wastelanders was the Brotherhood of Steel, who set up shop at the Atlas Observatory in the Savage Divide. The Brotherhood's brief questline would have the player complete a series of good Samaritan missions on their behalf, as the faction attempted to win the hearts and minds of the citizens nearby upon their arrival. Their character was definitely more akin to the Elder Lions chapter in Fallout 3 than the Maxon version in Fallout 4, or even how they were portrayed by Interplay. But no matter, during the Brotherhood quest over and out, we would be sent to investigate an abandoned Enclave research bunker on the far northwestern side of the map, in the hopes that we could use its communication infrastructure to link up with the main group back in California. While there, we would discover that the Enclave had been conducting a litany of experiments on virtually every organism in the wasteland, they even seemed to have captured a Mothman that they were studying. And, in one of the cells, specifically Z-05, we could find the remains of, well, you guessed it, several Zetan aliens lying in a pile. They seemed to have starved or had been liquidated shortly after the evacuation of the base. Sadly, no additional context is offered. If we take a look at a nearby database terminal, we'll find that the Enclave deliberately wiped all of the information about the Z5 cell and the Zaydens inside. Evidently, even in their final moments of chaos, the scientists at this base made a priority of ensuring this information wouldn't fall into anyone else's hands. 
Alas, the quest itself never elaborates upon the Zens. Our Brotherhood companions don't even seem to notice, let alone comment. I'm sure Reed Underwood and his brothers at the Quare Verum are rolling in their radioactive graves. Moving on, though, did you know Fallout 76 features an alien blaster? Indeed, southwest of the Philippi Battlefield Cemetery lies a decaying house sinking into a heavily irradiated pond. Inside the remains of this structure, we'll find a patched up hazmat suit, some cute alien themed toys, and a broken safe. With an alien blaster and a mysterious rusted key lying inside the cubby. The blaster is indeed the exact same asset from Fallout 4, identical in its appearance and animation. Though, notably, we don't actually get any ammo for this thing, so it's difficult to discern its actual performance. Indeed, in order to obtain the power cells necessary to use this device, we'll have to embark on quite the adventure. You see, while the game doesn't tell you this, there are no quest markers or really any indications at all of what to do next, if you head a good ways east to Freddy Fear's House of Scares, a large haunted house attraction, a locked shack can be identified on the roof, which the rusted key from that safe will unlock. And inside, we'll find a disorganized apartment containing an assortment of weird electronics that whoever occupied this place seemed to have been studying and very enthusiastic about. On the floor will be a note titled, Leaving Town. It simply reads, They're on to us. I was fired. I'm leaving town tonight. Stay safe. Signed, L.S. Nearby a broken terminal is a holotape titled Stolen Terminal Passcode, which can't be played back as it's technically not a holotape but a key, but it'll come in handy in a second. From here, our next move will be to head on over to the Shadow Breeze apartment complex in Morgantown, where we can find a large penthouse on the top floor, which once belonged to a very wealthy and suspicious man named Trevor Moorman. Moore as in Morocco, not in the... In, anyway. We'll find his terminal still usable beneath a somehow still functioning ominous light, which provides a bit more context on this situation. There are two entries. The first is titled Message from S. Wellingsworth, which reads, Mr. Mormon. Your new housekeeper, Mr. Arnold Butterwood, is available to start immediately. Please let us know what time would be most convenient for you for him to begin. As per your request, Miss Lena Stark, your former housekeeper, LS, has been terminated. Additionally, we have forwarded your concerns to the authorities. Please do not hesitate to contact me personally with any further concerns or questions. Thank you for your business. Samuel Wellingsworth. Interesting. So that LS character who wrote the note and was fleeing town earlier must have been this guy's maid. Clearly, she took something from him, presumably the blaster, and got found out. The next entry is an email from a Mike Green. Quote, Trevor, I'm moving everything to a more secure location. Reset your access code if you lose the holotape. I understand it can seem overly cautious, but we can't take any risks. I think someone has taken an interest in our work. I will let you know as soon as I know more. Mike. This terminal will also provide us with the opportunity to write a new passcode onto that holotape we got from the shack on top of the House of Scares. Evidently, the tape Mike is talking about also made it into Miss Stark's hands. 
With this holotape and the newly written password in our inventory, our next stop is Pleasant Valley Cabins, southeast of Morgantown, across the mountain range. Inside the largest and most luxurious of these cabins, we can find a note titled Trevor's Note beneath a terminal. Quote, Mike, I'm coming down to see the latest artifact as soon as I can. I'd like to bring an expert with me, a Mr. Christopher Weed. I trust him, but a background check might be in order. We're getting closer to the truth. Regards, Trevor. The terminal above this note contains no logs. Instead, it simply allows us to use the holotape we just wrote that passcode onto to generate a code. A code which can then be taken over to the cabin's safe and imprinted to unlock it. Inside of said safe is an assortment of random leveled loot and a key to the Black Mountain Ordnance Works second TNT dome. Black Mountain Ordnance Works is a large military testing facility on the far northwestern side of the map. It contains several sealed TNT domes which are locked with these massive mechanical doors. All of them are normally inaccessible to the player. We're just left to assume that there's some important item stored inside. But with this key, need we assume no longer. We will now be able to unlock door number two, and inside will be a remarkable sight. A small laboratory with a massive, mysterious cryo chamber is revealed, and on one of the tables will be three or four alien power cells, allowing us to finally load up our blaster, if only with a few more shots. Though, I think what's become of much greater interest is what's been going on in this place, and what's in that cryo chamber. It uses a similar asset to the chambers from Bolt 111, so we can only assume that something similar is up. Has someone been in there since pre-war times? Bethesda has purposely made it almost impossible to peer in, but clearly, something is up. Evidently, Trevor Moore, Mike Green, and company must have been studying the Zettons in the days before the war. At some point, Trevor's maid, for whatever reason, decided to steal an alien blaster from him and ran for it. It's unclear if she did so on her own intuition, or if she had been a spy deliberately planning this all along on behalf of some competing interest. Clearly, this TNT dome had been the nucleus of Trevor and Mike's operation. Thankfully, a recent Fallout 76 update has provided a bit more lore on this affair, but we'll get to that in a second. First, some words about the Alien Blaster. Thanks to its finite amount of ammo, literally just four shots, its slow projectile speed, and what appears to be a significant damage nerf compared to the Fallout 4 version, the Alien Blaster of 76 is a rather unremarkable device. It will often take several, like three, four, even five shots to stop an enemy, and frankly, there's just better things on the market. The Zettons really need to step up their game. Alas, in March of 2022, nearly one year ago, they did just that. As Fallout 76 received its Invaders from Beyond update. Similar to the Night of the Moth event we discussed in the last Dunwich video, Invaders from Beyond was a temporary event that only lasted for a couple of weeks. But boy, was it not lacking in the lore department. Once again, big shout out to Uranium Fever for providing like 80 or 90% of the footage in this segment, as I don't know what I would have done without those clips. Nonetheless, this event revolved around, well, a Zayden invasion of Appalachia. For a few weeks, a series of new alien-themed random encounters overran the map and unique world events were triggered where legions of Zaydens would beam down from their spacecraft to storm key locations across the map. 
it would be up to players to resist such an impending occupation in their daily ops feed. This all would provide an ample opportunity to dramatically restock our alien blaster power cells. And towards the end of each big battle, we'd get a glimpse of a special Zeta General who would don a unique set of alien power armor. Furthermore, through our Pip-Boy radio, we'd be introduced to a new, very mysterious character named Homer Saperstein, which sounds like a certain species of sapiens that I will not say because I am deeply afraid of offending the algorithm in any way. Anyway, Saperstein was a weird fellow. He'd refuse to provide his location, simply saying he was somewhere safe, and made it clear that he's a deeply antisocial individual. Furthermore, many of his dialogue lines were... suspicious, to say the least. Some of his highlights include phrases like, Of course I am human, and... I've had many conversations with other humans. You know, things like that. It's heavily implied, though never explicitly confirmed, that Mr. Saperstein was something other than man. No matter, he would walk the player through the Zayden attack events, directing us on how to destroy their communication beacons and alerting the Vault Dweller to incoming Zedan waves. Homer claims to have been studying the aliens for decades, maybe even centuries, and has allegedly developed a means of intercepting their communications and roughly translating their language. He seemed genuinely committed to the defense of Earth, but again, his nature and motives remain in question. Now, here's where things get really fun. While most of the random encounters brought on by this seasonal event were rather straightforward alien patrols who we'd ambush or be ambushed by, a certain new, extremely rare random encounter became available, wherein a man in black called the Emissary could be met, just walking about on the roads. When approached, he would say one of a few phrases of dialogue, making strange, esoteric comments about the cosmos before disappearing in a flash of light. Oh, neighbor, it's so good to see you again. When was the last time you laid supine in a field and gazed at the celestial bodies in the sky? I believe you may have met what is wrong, neighbor. Are you suddenly aware of your surroundings? If you would be so kind as to look this way. What on earth? Who is this man? Well, we'll get to that. Now, after this encounter with the Emissary, this first one, a second one would become available at a later point in time where his lifeless body could be found surrounded by a group of hostile extraterrestrials, suggesting that whatever he is slash was, the man in black, the emissary, is an enemy of the aliens as well. In his inventory would be some miscellaneous leveled loot, and more importantly, a mysterious key, which if taken back to the Black Mountain Ordnance site, would open up another TNT vault, specifically Dome Number 8, and inside would lie an even more shocking sight than the last one. It's another lab setting, though this one features an alien lying lifeless on a medical table, clearly for some kind of examination, and several alien artifacts, including a blaster, though we can't pick it up for ourselves, are also present. Most notably of all, however, we'd encounter Homer, not in the flesh, but on a monitor, in a Mr. House-esque setting. We'd be able to engage in a brief bit of dialogue with the totally human NPC, though he wouldn't reveal much beyond what we've already learned, 
nor fully explain the nature of this strange lab of his. It's ultimately unclear what Mr. Staperstein actually is. An artificial intelligence, or some third species of extraterrestrial, maybe? But he seems to have been in league with the Emissary, given the key and the fact that the Man in Black 2 seemed opposed to the aliens. Some players have theorized that maybe Homer is inside of that cryopod, and what we're interacting with is some sort of artificial interface of his intelligence or some bit of consciousness that he's able to project. Alternatively, the individual in that stasis chamber could have been Trevor Mormon, or one of his associates like Mike Green. Whatever the case, it seems extremely unlikely that these characters aren't all in some way connected. I mean, what a coincidence it would be if Trevor Mormon and his alien operation just so happened to set up shop in a dome right next to Mr. Saperstein and the Emissary's location. It's unclear whether or not the Man in Black is himself a humanoid. He looks the part, but some of his dialogue options make it a little more ambiguous. I also think it's worth noting that the Emissary bears some shocking similarities to the Mysterious Stranger, the special perk character we encounter throughout all of the Fallout games. Like the Mysterious Stranger, the Emissary dons an interesting trench coat, top hat, scarf, and boasts the ability to teleport. Perhaps through this character in future updates, we'll learn more about the nature of the Stranger. Alternatively, many folks have also pointed out that the character featured on Astoundingly Awesome Tales No. 8, titled The Man Who Could Stop Time Magazine in Fallout 4, bears a bit of resemblance to the Emissary. Perhaps he is a time traveler of some kind. Still though, with all of these mysterious parts, the laboratories, the cryo chamber, the identity of Homer, the Emissary, it's very difficult to draw lines connecting these parts together. Ultimately, the Invaders from Beyond update leaves us with far more questions about the Zetans and what's going on than it does answers. And that is why I insist that Fallout's alien mystery has only been getting weirder with time. Ladies and gentlemen, from a single innocuous crash site in the Boston Commonwealth, to a bizarre group of fanatics who are somehow in possession of extraterrestrial technology, to an assortment of pre-war government experiments, Today we have examined virtually everything there is to examine about the Zens. And yet somehow, I feel as though we've ended up with far more questions than answers. Friends, Romans, countrymen, citizens of the Legion, this has been our longest lore investigation yet. An hour and 40 minutes. If you've been watching from the beginning, thank you so much. In that time, you could have watched The Lion King Toy Story, built 10% of a town hall in Clash of Clans, and so many other things, so thank you for choosing to spend such time here. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm. Now, if you still haven't got your alien fix, however, the YouTube channel Uranium Fever, who is such a help on this video, has an upcoming video about their own Zetan theories and hypotheses coming out sometime around this one is. It may already be up or just a day or so away, but will be linked in the description when it's ready, so you may continue scratching your Zetan itch. Their cinematography and audio is tremendous, you shan't be disappointed. Also, again, unforgettable thanks to TKS Mantis for providing so much of the isometric Fallout content. Just like myself and Uranium Fever, he too has a buttery voice and excellent Fallout cinematography. Be sure to show him some love. But with that all out of the way, thank you so much for stopping by, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone. And don't forget to check out War Thunder, the most complete vehicular combat and strategy game on the market, using my link in the description for a free bonus pack. War Thunder is available on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox, and it's all in resolutions as high as 4K.